wabarakatuh. Um, ya, selamat datang. Nanti aja kita mulai kalau nanti ada tamunya baru baru ini uh, apa berbahasa Inggris. Jadi uh, yang hari ini uh, kita akan ada kedatangan uh, beberapa guest speakers. Uh, yang pertama karena tadi perubahan jadwal. Jadi yang uh, speaker pertama adalah Pak Pak Anggito dari Pusat Penelitian Fisika. Uh, beliau ini adalah um, apa namanya anggota uh, ketua kelompok penelitian uh, dari yang dari Keltian kami yaitu uh, apa nama kita Keltian kita <laughs> Advanced Magnetic and Materials ya. Ya itulah pokoknya. Yang nanti mungkin akan berubah juga. Uh, saat ini beliau uh, sebagai peneliti ahli media, kemudian tema uh, tema riset yang saat ini sedang di, uh, dilakukan adalah thermally functional materials, magnetic materials, magnetic nanofluids, thermal magnetic convection, heat transfer, and fluid dynamics. Jadi lumayan banyak dan uh, berhubungan dengan thermal thermal. Maka dari itu uh, kita langsung saja ke Pak Anggito untuk um, membahas lebih jauh tentang uh, topik topik topnya yaitu thermal management using functional materials. Silakan Pak Anito. Oke, okay. suara saya sudah terdengar ya. Halo, suara saya sudah terdengar belum ya? Sudah Pak Anggito, sudah. Oh, ya. Oke, okay. assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for coming to this presentation. Uh, today I would like to share uh, some knowledge related to thermal management uh, in several devices using functional materials. Uh, my name is Angita Tutuko. I uh, currently work as a researcher at the Research Center for Physics. Uh, I don't know, currently we changed the name, yeah? Now the National Research and Innovation Agency or BRIN, Badan Riset uh, dan Inovasi Nasional. Okay, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, background of thermal management, thermal management in fan fuel cells, and functional materials used in thermal management. Okay, uh, there are various reasons why thermal management is very important in several design, in several devices, such as uh, fuel cells, solar cells, or lithium ion batteries. Uh, the first purpose is to dissipate the heat and reduce the overheating. Uh, second is to maintain certain working temperature. For example, uh, in a fan fuel cell, we have to maintain the. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Pak Anggito, I'm very sorry. I yeah. forgot to ask Burike for. Uh, <laughs> for okay. For so your... maybe I will stop my talk, yeah? Yes, will... yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I will give the time for Burike first. Okay. Okay, then. Oh, <laughs> lagi, <man. laughs> okay. Okay. monitor yang lain, okay. Oke, okay, Buri itu uh, gimana ini? Buri tadi enggak enggak well prepare ya? Aduh, sorry sorry. Ya, Bu, jadi lipinya lipinya sudah hilang, <laughs> jadi kalau Abu Riki itu kapus gitu. <laughs> jadi, ya ya. Uh, kepala baik, kantor baik. kan jadi. <laughs> ya, uh, kita bahas ini sih aja ya. Uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam bagi kita semua, alhamdulillah bisa berjumpa pada pada uh, pagi hari ini uh, di acara seminar uh, dan uh, bapak ibu semua uh, yang saya hormati, terima kasih atas partisipasinya pada pagi hari ini dan seperti kita tahu bahwa kita sekarang uh, one family ya satu brin ya kalau dari Batan BPPT Lipi itu 8 gitu ya satu 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 keluarga lah ya sekarang sudah uh, transformasinya sudah begitu cepat dan uh, nah acara hari ini adalah salah satu uh, acara bulanan sebetulnya yang saya minta kepada seluruh uh, research group di pusat penelitian fisika uh, untuk uh, apa mempromosikan topik risetnya yang ada di uh, grupnya masing-masing jadi kita memang tiap bulan ada kadang-kadang dua mingguan juga ada gitu ya dua mingguan juga ada nah dua mingguan memang ada di kita ada uh, tim kolokium fisika yang uh, apa diinisiasi tahun lalu oleh uh, Pak Rituan jadi sekarang ditelanjutkan uh, di masa-masa pandemi ini sangat bermanfaat mudah-mudahan sangat bermanfaat oleh karena itu uh, pada siang hari ini uh, apa kita dengarkan bersama-sama ya 
walaupun masih situasi pandemi dan kemudian juga transformasi reorganisasi, mudah-mudahan tidak menghilangkan semangat kita semua untuk terus menjalankan saintifik aktivitasnya di, di risetnya masing-masing. Dan oleh karena itu terakhir, saya ucapkan terima kasih pada grup Advanced and Non-Magnetic Materials untuk uh, mengorganize ini pada bulan September nanti bulan Insya Allah bulan depan ada lagi dan uh, dua, dua mingguan juga akan ada lagi uh, semoga pertemuan ini bisa uh, memberikan manfaat uh, khususnya bagi kawan-kawan semua yang satu bidang ilmu ya itu saja dari saya uh, terima kasih terus uh, uh, semangat tadi saya klarifikasi uh, ke panitia dan Soalnya saya mau eh, mohon izin saya mau lift ada pertemuan lain soalnya. Jadi eh, apa lift dari meeting ini eh, dan terima kasih Pak Anggito eh, sebagai ketua grup dari grup riset eh, advance and mat magnetic materials. Mudah-mudahan eh, kita semua sehat selalu. Amin, sehat. Bu. terima kasih. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, yes, I'm very sorry for that, uh, Miss. <laughs> Miss okay, I'm sorry. Okay, now uh, we can continue with the uh, talk of uh, Bang Gito. Time okay. To... okay, okay, I will continue uh, my presentation. Okay, um, in several devices such as uh, fuel cell, we have to maintain certain working temperature. For example, in fuel cells, uh, we have to maintain around 55 up to 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, the third reason why thermal management is important is to improve the performance of the systems, to improve lifetimes uh, and reduce maintenance costs, and to transfer the heat for other purposes. For example, uh, in, in the research of uh, thermal coupling of ramp fuel cells uh, and metal hydrates, the heat that needs to be displayed from the ramp fuel cells can be used for enhancing the hydrogen flow rate in metal hydrates. And the last reason is to increase the system's overall efficiency. Uh, in order to fully understand uh, the thermal management in the device, uh, we have to also know the fundamental science of thermal management, uh, such as the heat transfer, how, how the heat is transferred like, through conduction, through convection, whether it's natural or forced convection, radiations, and also we have to know the fluid dynamics. For example, we use an active cooling by adding some equipment such as pump or blower. We have to know the, the The how the fluid uh, flow, uh, liquid or gas, and also the thermodynamics yeah? uh, related to materials and good properties because it's, it's very important for this, for designing thermal management in the in the device, such as maybe thermal conductivity, specific heat, and etc. Um, there are two type of uh, thermal management that can be applied in a device uh, versus the active thermal management, such as the one that I already mentioned previously. Uh, we can use pump uh, if we use uh, liquid, and also we can use blower or fan uh, if the fluid is air. Uh, however, in active thermal management, uh, there will be a parasitic energy because uh, the energy that, or the electricity that has been produced by the device, such as the fuel cells, Uh, must be used for uh, for turn on the pump or blower. Uh, the second uh, method is uh, passive thermal management. So uh, first, we just can rely on the, using the natural convections, how the temperature difference between the device and also the surrounding air maybe. And also we can use the high thermal conductivity materials such as the pyrolithographic sheet that have a very uh, high thermal conductivity. We can also use phase change materials Phase change materials currently attract many researchers and engineers to be used in a thermal management device because its capability to absorb and transfer the heat. And the last but not least is heat pipe. So for those of you who are not familiar with heat pipes, uh, heat pipes uh, actually a vacuum tubes or pipes. Uh, it consists of three main parts. It's evaporator sections, adiabatic sections, and conductor sections. Uh, inside the heat pipe, we, ins uh, we insert the working fluid or liquid as a media to transfer the heat and also the uh, weak structure. So basically, when uh, when the heat is uh, applied on the evaporator section of the heat pipes, 
uh, the working liquid, uh, the, the heat will be transferred through conductions from the outer surface of the pipe or the tube to the inner surface of the, of the pipe and then to the weak structures and the heat uh, will change the phase of the working liquid inside the evaporator sections and the uh, working uh, liquid will change its phase to vapor and will flow to the condenser sections as a result of uh, pressure uh, difference and also less density. In the condenser sections, uh, after releasing the heat, uh, the vapor will, will change its mass again, uh, condensation process, and then it will go back to the evaporator section based on the capillary effect. Uh, this process will continue as long as there's supply heat to the upper sections of the heat pipe. So as, ma as I mentioned previously, heat pipes uh, consist of several components. First is the container materials. A lot of uh, researchers and engineers use metals, uh, ceramics, composite as, a, as a main materials for the containers. And also the second component is the big materials. Uh, weak materials is very important in order for, for the liquid uh, movements after being condensed and then in the condenser sections of the heat pipes. A lot of researchers use uh, different type of materials like from cinder powders, screen mass, uh, fiber, porous materials, and etc. And also for the working liquids, uh, we can use uh, uh, water, for example, methanols, or also nanofluids. Uh, heat pipes have been used in many, many applications by researchers and engineers, such as an electronic device, maybe if you, and also PC laptop. If you open your laptop, you can see uh, there's uh, heat pipes uh, attached with fins uh, for removing the heat in the laptops or PC. Uh, heat pipe also can be used for uh, in electric motors, solar cell, by attaching the heat pipes at the back of the solar cell for absorbing the, the heat that is generated. Uh, heat pipe also can be used in lithium and batteries and also in plant fuel cell. Uh, heat pipes, uh, we can design heat pipe in several types. Uh, the most common is cylindrical heat pipes. And then there's, there's a flattened and bent heat pipe. Basically, flattened and bent heat pipe is a cylindrical heat pipe, but the manufacturers uh, change the design by flattening usually the condenser sections and, and bending the the adiabatic and internal sections. Other type that can also be used uh, as a thermal management in devices, pulsating heat pipes, uh, loop heat pipes, and also micro heat pipes. So usually, if we want to test a heat pipe as a thermal management device, we have to prepare several equipments. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in this uh, slide uh, uh, from our published paper from ASRIAT 2021, we prepare the heat pipes by heating up the evaporator sections uh, using the dual heating method by attaching the nitrum wire and then ferrying the uh, power supplies. And then we also attach uh, several thermocouples and that have been connected to the data logger and computers to monitor the uh, temperature distributions. So uh, what can we obtain from the Heat pipe test. So first, the most common is the temperature distributions. Yeah, uh, temperature as a function of length, uh, temperature as a function of time. So also, we can calculate the overall thermal resistance and the effective thermal conductivity. So, based on based on literature, the, the thermal conductivity of the heat pipes is can reach almost one hundred thousand watt per meter kelvin. So, it's very high and it's very effective to be used as a as a cooling or thermal management device. And also from the test, we can observe the uh, maximum heat dissipation. Uh, this is uh, one of the examples of the results from the heat pipe test, uh, the temperature as a function of time. So we can see that uh, at the beginning, the temperature starts to increase and then becomes steady uh, where the circulation or the heat transfer is uh, occurred in an optimum way. And also, for example, if we combine the heat pipe with, uh, uh, with the fan, so we can see that in figure for A uh, is the conditions where we apply air around uh, one meter per second as uh, a media for removing the heat. And we can see by improving the 
air velocity up to four four meter per seconds, we can see that the temperature drop uh, quite uh, uh, good. Uh, heat map is also affected by its designs. First is the effective lengths. Yeah, so if we improve the effective lengths, of, of course, the capability of the heat pipes uh, for removing the heat is also reduced because of um, larger pressure uh, drops between the evaporator sections and also the uh, condenser sections. However, if we increase the diameter of the heat pipe, uh, we can gain more heat dissipation capability uh, as a result of the larger heat uh, transfer area. Uh, this is a uh, case studies where heat pipe is used uh, in a thermal management of uh, PAM fuel cells. So basically in this uh, schematic diagram or experimental setup, we try to manage uh, thermal in, in PAM fuel cells that can produce uh, electricity up to 200 watts. And then we couple the, we thermally couple the systems using the metal hydrates. So basically the PAM fuel cell needs to remove the heat in order to maintain its working temperatures. On the other hand, the metal hydrates need heat in their endothermic reaction for enhancing the hydrogen discharging rate. So in this uh, systems, uh, we try to manage the heat uh, that is uh, that have been dissipated from PAM fuel cells uh, and transfer it to the uh, metal hydrates. Um, we we try to put a lot of thermocouples in order to make to monitor the temperature distributions and also several equipment such as pressure gauge, regulator flow meter in order to uh, analyze uh, how this heat can affect the uh, the hydrogen enhancements in the metal hydrate. So in this system, we use two type of heat pipe. First is the uh, top heat pipes where the fins were attached uh, at the condenser sections of the heat pipe for improving its uh, heat transfer capability. And also uh, the second heat pipe is bottom heat pipes. Uh, it's bent and flattened heat pipes that have been connected to the metal hydrate. Uh, this is uh, results from the CAT articles that have been validated with the experimental results. So we can see we, we try to model the uh, fuel cell performance by using MATLAB, and then we plot the output voltage as a function of, of output powers. Sorry, output voltage and output power as a function of current density. And we can see that the uh, models and the experimentals uh, uh, has a good agreement. Uh, from these models and the experimental intensification validations, we can we can calculate the heat by using some equations in order to uh, obtain uh, the heat generation and also the cooling load that need to be uh, dissipated uh, from the systems. Uh, we also create the models. We develop models uh, where we try to uh, calculate or try to um, uh, validate uh, the heat pipe that have been manufactured by Fujikura in Japan. And then we, all, we can see also that uh, the, uh, the models uh, has a good, good agreement with the experimental uh, investigations. Uh, similar as in the top heat pipes, uh, we try to develop also the models and try to match the, the performance of the heat pipes. Um, we also try to playing around with the uh, fin lengths and also the air velocity. How can we improve the performance of the heat pipe for removing the heat if we try to vary different factors such as the fin lengths and the air velocity? Um, this is another results from the um, investigations, the hydrogen discharging rates and heat as a function of time. So we can see that uh, we need to uh, maintain uh, 1.7 standard liter per minute in order to be used as the main fuels in the fuel cells for, for obtaining the 200 watts. So we can see that uh, without adding the heat, uh, the hydrogen discharging rate uh, will drop. And we can see that in figure 11b, uh, hydrogen discharging rate in metal hydrates and heat demanded as a function of temperature. So uh, basically we need to maintain the temperature of the canisters around 20 to 30 degrees Celsius in order to, to obtain those 1.7 standard liter per minute to be used uh, in the uh, 
uh, the fuel as the main fuel. Uh, this is another result from the investigation. So we can see that the output powers and also the hydrogen demand by the fuel cell as a function of times. Uh, if the hydrogen cannot uh, cannot be supplied at those uh, values, the power will drop. And also in figure 12p, we can see that the uh, hydrogen uh, discharging rate and temperature of the metal hydride canister as a function of uh, time. So uh, if there's uh, no heat applied to the canisters, the temperature will drop and the hydrogen discharging rate will reduce as simple as that. So thermal management is very important in this, in this case studies where the heat will be used to enhance the hydrogen flow in the metal hydride. Uh, this is also the uh, temperatures of the uh, pan fuel cells and cooling plate and heat pipes by attaching those uh, thermocouples. So uh, we can see there's a, a drop or a point, yeah? This is caused by the fan, yeah? So basically uh, we, we use some sensors if the temperature goes high, for example, up to uh, 70 degrees Celsius, the, turn, the fan will turn on automatically and uh, will uh, absorb the heat. And that's why the temperature distributions uh, uh, reduce. Okay. Um, I have shared some uh, related research related to thermal management and why is thermal management is very important. And now we continue to uh, functional materials uh, used in thermal management. Uh, we can use uh, nanofluids as a working liquid in heat pipes. So uh, nanofluid is uh, actually um, a base fluid that consists of dispersed uh, particles. Uh, nanopartic uh, there are lots of nanoparticles that can be used in the nanofluid such as alumina, uh, magnetite, the zinc oxide, uh, copper oxide, titanium oxide, and extra. And we also can use uh, different best fluids, uh, water, ethylene, glycol, acetone, and etc. The problems of the nanofluid is the sedimentation. Uh, this is caused by the, uh, that's why we need a surfactant coating materials and we have to uh, maintain the pH level. For example, uh, from our uh, published papers uh, by Asli at 2021, uh, we try to synthesize um, magnetite particles, uh, and then we try to uh, mod, uh, coating the surface using the polyethylene glycols in order to reduce the agglomerations and also the sedimentation, and try to uh, modify its surface into hydrophilics because if we can change the surface of the particles into hydrophilics, the particles will, is, will be easily dispersed uh, in the nanofluid. So uh, we also use uh, different types of uh, uh, adding such as surfactants and also we maintain the pH level. So we can see that uh, in figure A is very poor nanofluids where the particles is uh, sedimented as a result of uh, high agglomerations and sedimentation. However, in a figure uh, B, we can see that it's a very stable nanofluid where the particles is evenly and homogeneously dispersed in the nanofluid. And then we try to uh, characterize the nanoparticles by using excess data point from where this, uh, the magnetite phase is obtained and also some uh, to uh, Efficient characterizations in order to measure the uh, dis particle distributions and also some characterizations. Uh, the most important thing is the setup potential. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we try to compare the visual, the visual observations uh, with the uh, measurement using setup and potential, and con it's confirmed that the nanofluid is stable because it's it can reach a minus 52.41 volts. 
uh, and then we try to test the uh, working liquid of the nanofluids in the systems uh, where uh, we try to analyze its temperature distributions by using uh, several equipments. And then we uh, obtain that the uh, nanofluids or higher concentration of the nanoparticles uh, can reduce the uh, temperatures to be compared to the less uh, nanoparticle concentrations. Okay, uh, besides uh, use in uh, heat pipes, a nanofluid also can be used in different applications such as the cooling medium in PAM fuel cells. Uh, by uh, as a coolant, uh, where the nanofluid is flown in the cooling channel of the pan fuel cell. We can also use in the cooling system of a solar cell by attaching a cooling channel at the back of the solar cells. And we can use also in, uh, in the cell in an energy exchange changer and a coolant for internal combustion engines. Uh, there's this is another type of metals that can be used in thermal management, such as the metal foams. Metal foams uh, can be used uh, in the weak structure of the heat pipes. Uh, this is the one that we try to assemble in our lab uh, with our researcher, uh, where the metal foam uh, were cut and then was cut and then insert it in the heat pipe as a weak structure. The problem of the metal foam is uh, we need to treat it the metal foam uh, before it uh, used as, um, as a weak structure media by modifying its surface into hydrophilics. Because uh, hydrophilic surface tend to improve the capability of the fluids uh, movement from the condenser sections to the evaporator sections of the heat pipe. Uh, this is some characterizations related to the metal forms, how it's been treated using, for example, using acetone, and then we try to compare it using super hydrophobic coated. And then this is the one of the most important uh, characterizations conducted by uh, Buniming in our lab. So basically, we try to uh, analyze the wettability of the surface by dropping the uh, water droplet on the surface of the metal foam and then we, we can analyze its contact angles. Uh, metal foam also can be used in different thermal management systems uh, besides uh, heat pipes such as in lithium batteries, uh, PAM fuel cells. Uh, it also can be used in cooling medium in gas turbines and a heat sink in electronic device. Uh, this is not the type of uh, material that also can support uh, for the applications of the thermal management, such as the sinter powders, which also can be used uh, in the weak structures of the heat pipes for improving uh, the performance of the heat pipe. Uh, we try to analyze the commercial uh, heat pipes, uh, and then we, we found out that you, we find out that uh, they use uh, sinter copper powder as the as the weak structure material. Uh, this is another uh, results from the analysis. And also, we try to analyze its contact angle because you know, contact angle is very important parameters uh, in the heat pipes. Where, as I've mentioned previously, that uh, uh, hydrophilic surface is needed for improving uh, the performance. Okay. Uh, maybe we can uh, continue to the last section. So if there's a student that is, that is interested to join our research group and to work with us, uh, we have several topics uh, related to nanofluids as a working liquid in heat pipe. We try to use maybe different type of particles. Maybe we, we can use uh, alumina, uh, graphene oxide or other type of materials. And we, we are currently working on the porous materials uh, to be used as a weak structures in heat pipes. Uh, we also uh, interested in the phase change materials, particularly paraffins, maybe by adding materials in order to improve its thermal conductivity to be used in the cooling or thermal management systems. 
Uh, also, there's a topic related to concrete material as a thermal storage medium. And maybe that student that interested in simulations, we also have some topic related to uh, thermal management in uh, lithium batteries and cooling system and time process. Uh, this is the reference. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Maybe Bowita, uh, I'll stop my presentation here. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Angit, for that presentation. So uh, we will give the audience to ask questions, or or just probably uh, if there are any things that um, need to be discussed. Um, with Dr. with Dr. Angito. And uh, please, uh, is anyone, does anyone have any question or um, opinions perhaps? Then uh, I'll try to ask uh, a little bit so, uh, Elder Angito, so the uh, heat pipe as the thermal management here, uh, we, I have seen the uh, calculation or the uh, method for the simulation, right, for the calculation of the thermal parameters that you are uh, using in your research, <clears throat> excuse me. So besides the one that you are uh, applying in, in, in your research, is there any other methods besides uh, or probably alternatives or uh, the future methods or other other kinds of, of methods for uh, finding the uh, thermal uh, parameters. Uh, do you mean different type of heat pipes or different thermal management device that can be applied in the systems? Uh, the uh, thermal management device. Okay, so uh, currently let, uh, there's a interesting research related to thermomagnetic convection. So basically, uh, we try to, uh, they try to use uh, ferrofluids that has uh, magnetic properties mm -hmm. inside the pipes. And then they try to modify the flow of the fluids into turbulence uh, by, by attaching or adding permanent magnet outside the, the pipe. So it's very interesting what in experimentals and simulations because of the magnetic properties, uh, the ferrofluid will change the flow into turbulence and, and turbulent flows, uh, it's good for, for improving heat transfer uh, in the systems. Uh, I think that's Mbak Wita. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Mbak Wita, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, uh, go ahead, Professor. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and good morning, Angit. Good morning, Prof. Ginting. Uh, okay, just simple question, Angit. Okay, from this uh, research that we, we are doing in our laboratory about the heat pipe, what is actually the target of this uh, research mm -hmm. according to the what is our government's uh, requesting? the application that really will serve our need. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Our target is currently still improving the thermal management, sorry, the thermal resistance of the heat pipes. We try to match uh, at least uh, one uh, degree Celsius per watts related to thermal, to, related to thermal resistance because if we can reduce the thermal resistance up to those points, we can improve its thermal conductivity and we can we can use in different applications because there's a lot of parameters that uh, we need to to change or to analyze such as the weak structures inside the heat pipes and also the the nanofluids that we are using in, in as a working liquids. And for the maybe related to the government request, uh, currently we are working on the research uh, uh, funded by the uh, BRIN, yeah, or maybe LIPI previously. Uh, we try to use uh, this heat pipe where the nanofluids or the parafluid used as a working liquid 
uh, to be used as a thermal management in lithium ion batteries because we all know that in the future maybe we will we will we will change the uh, to electricity cars and one of the components or one of the parts that was that's very important is the lithium ion batteries and in lithium ion batteries we have to maintain the temperatures less than uh, 50 to 60 degrees celsius in order for for the lithium ion batteries to produce an optimum results so maybe that's my uh, answer professor ginting okay may i make some suggestion yeah yeah okay. of, course. of course i think uh, we should we should uh, contact the companies that are might be interested in this research mm -hmm. uh, so we can offer the what we can do for them so this research will be really beneficial for the companies okay? because maybe they don't know what mm -hmm. we are doing so i think we should as we already discussed many times but we haven't done it like, like yeah. we should make a task force so we should visit the companies that yeah. are really really uh, uh using this uh heat pipes yeah 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 actually with uh, dr Danny hire nini from uh, fuel cell research group mm -hmm. uh, we have some projects with uh, industries uh, by using the combinations of of phase change materials because the the, uh, the industry was manufacturing uh, PCM. So we try to combine the, the PCM paraffin with the heat pipes mm -hmm. uh, to be used in the thermal management of uh, lithium and battery. But the, the the research is still in progress because we're still waiting for on them to purchase some equipment and materials uh, to be to be used as our uh, component or, or materials in our labs. Uh, Professor Ginting. Good. Okay. Thank you, Angit. Thank you, Prof Ginting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ginting, for that question. Uh, in the audience, is there any is there any questions for this topic? Is thermal uh, thermal management uh, topic and um, if and the correlation with the, with the uh, functional material? Um, okay. Okay, uh, Dr. Ita? Yes, yes. Can I have a. Who is this? Hello. Okay, Dr. Ita? Ah, yes, yes. Ah, I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Angit. Yes, yes, please. Yes, Dr. Agum, how are you? Dr. Angit, <laughs> I'm from. Uh, is a center of metallurgy and material. Yeah, yeah. And you're, the yeah you're, you're the famous. You're the oh, yeah, famous. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Human hang me lane at share screen too. Yeah. I, I want to ask the, about the thermoelectric material. Are your are your research uh, uh, team considering this material okay. for your research object? Uh, thank you, Dr. Agum. Uh, yeah. For thermoelectric material, I think it's already being handled by Dr. Teddy in in Bandung. Yeah, I yeah. Know. And and also yeah. the si the simulation was oh, conducted by, by Dr. Heskey. So I, I yeah. our group yeah. we're not focusing on on the thermoelectric material. Ah, uh, I see. So we are focusing on different 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 materials. Yeah, okay. different materials. Oh, how about the magnetocaloric? No. Yeah, okay. magnetic colored okay. materials. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, magnetic colored materials. I think it's uh, Dr. Wita research yeah. project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think she's the expert. So if you're interested to to join the yeah. the research, yeah, we can we can discuss together. But it, I think it's it's more appropriate to uh, Dr. Wita. Gimana, Mbak Wita? <laughs> Mr. Agung, yeah. uh, Dr. Agung. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just want to. I just want to know uh, about your research uh, material. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Dr. Mita, maybe we can uh, yes. help the uh, question because I, I I didn't do the magnetic colored materials. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, what was the question? Magnetic colored material. Magnetic colored 
research related to magnetic caloric materials. Oh, magnetic caloric. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, magnetic caloric. Uh, well, actually, it's, it's a collaboration as well with uh, Universitas Indonesia and yeah. some and a, a friend of mine in Vietnam as well. Yeah. So we are doing the magnetic caloric, but in collaboration. So we are not doing it uh, specifically in in our uh, our place, our uh, yeah. uh, research physics research center. But we are doing collaborations with other. Uh, okay other institute and universities it's in, it's still in manganese of uh, perovskite uh, perovskite manganese uh, yeah, outside. Perovskite uh, yes we're still doing that and um, yeah. yeah but basically manganese oxides for magnetic uh, magnetic color but other than that probably uh, we can do um, other materials as well uh, but we are not doing it uh, as for now. But, so if you have any 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 ideas or um, you you want to share um, the uh, collaboration ideas with um, in, in, about this uh, magnetic caloric, please, uh, we are very welcome. Yeah. And uh, open open arms with open arms. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Pago, Dr. Agu. Yeah. And uh, in the audience, there are um, no questions left. So we can uh, probably go to the next uh, speaker who, are, who is already here with us. Um, so before we begin uh, the, the speaker, second speaker session, I will try to uh, read a bit about his uh, CV and um, let me see. Okay, here we go. Uh, his name is Dick Hai Tran. Actually, he is an old friend of mine uh, when we are doing PhD. So um, I invited uh, Professor Tran to join us and uh, share a bit about, <coughs> me, about his uh, research. So Professor uh, Dick Hai Tran, uh, is now residing in Vietnam. He is the uh, faculty member of, of Faculty of Physics, uh, Department of Low Temperature Physics, Faculty of Physics, Vietnam National University. So since 2015, he is the uh, uh, lecturer and now currently he is as the assistant professor at his department. Um, and his research interests um, including, uh, let me see, okay, applications of nanotechnology to vortex dynamics of materials, especially vortex pinning research. And second interest is um, synthesis and investigating of structural magnetic superconducting properties of nanostructured functional materials, micro -thick, micron thick and multi-layer films. And the third one is fabrication of high temperature superconducting materials, buffered layers for corded conductors or cables and electronic devices. So there are a few of, uh, few of ongoing research projects. So it's, um, it's well, including um, improvements of critical current density in the uh, uh, BS, BSLC, Oh, uh, high temperature so superconductor and um, also distribution effects of distribution roles of semiconducting oxide nanoparticles and uh, semiconducting ions inside crystal lattice uh, of the uh, HTS, uh, high temperature superconductor. So, and then also he is investigating uh, BC BSCCO and YBCO. Uh, high temperature superconductors for electrical transmission applications. And also if you're studying about a magnetic caloric uh, effect in nanostructure um, uh, materials and metal nanocomposites. Um, and the last one is um, about, uh, there's plenty, plenty of his research, ongoing research, magnetic caloric effect of some micro nanostructure perovskite manganite based on 
uh, LCMO. It's uh, first and second order magnetic phase transition. So this is uh, pretty much um, correlated with uh, Dr. Agum's question earlier about the magnetic color. Probably after this session, you can ask uh, you can ask more um, about the uh, future collaboration with uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Tran. Okay, so uh, hello, Dick, uh, are you there? Hello, uh, hello, everybody. Could you listen to me well? Yes, yes, we can hear. Okay, you. thank you so much. Yes. So yeah. um, next talk will be uh, brought by Professor Dick Hai Tran about what is your topic. Ah, here you go. It's a potential approaches to study high temperature superconductors and functional materials. Okay, if you are ready. You can start your um, talk presentation. Okay. Okay, so I'm ready now. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, Dr. Uta, for inviting me to give the talk. I think if the co if the COVID ends, we'll be able to visit each other and give uh, like a uh, the offline talk and we can like uh, do more collaboration and stronger collaboration between our university and Indonesian uh, university and institute, right? Yes, definitely. Could you listen to, still listen to me? Yes, I, yes. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, and then I was, and I have got a uh, really surprised for the very strong and interest, interesting introduction part given by Dr. Ui, with her, my limit when we were in Korea, probably seven or 10 years ago, as I remember. And after I back from Korea, I, after back to Vietnam, I still trying to focus on the study on the superconductivity. And my talk today, I would like to say something about the potential approaches to study high temperature superconductors and functional material. Um, uh, first, uh, so probably, probably it's the first time uh, the Vietnamese scientist give a talk with you. So I'd like to give a short uh, introduction about our university. Our university is located to just take 34 minutes from by airport. So when people come here, like a, look the long time ago, our friend, the Thai here probably has visitors. And our, our university was built in more than 100 years ago when we were colony of French. And from 1956, with the names, the name was changed to University of Hanoi, and from 2013 now, we use the name Vietnam National University and University of Shans. This means that in the Vietnam National University, we still have a several more universities, like social science, economy, chemistry, and uh, business or technology. And it is my Super thing physics group. It is my my group. Currently, I have a three PhD student and three master student, and they are all full time. And uh, for my group interaction, uh, Dr. Ita has explained about my research interest. It was two details, so I like to skip here. And for the funding for my lab now, we can, in Vietnam, we have several funding resources like from National Resource Fund Funding, NRF, and now I owning four, four projects, and we can have another funding resource from Ministry of Education and the training of directly from our national university. And then for the scholarship for stu student, we can have several supported support like from national research funding or from national Vietnam national university or from uh, two years ago, Vingroup 
Foundation has established the big big scholarship for master, PhD, and even the postdoc student. So all people, Vietnamese citizen, could apply for that. And in my group, there are four students. They are getting uh, Vin Group scholarship. It's around seven thousand US dollars per year. It's not small, I think, especially in Vietnam. Even is enough for their family life. And I would like to show something about uh, the, exper the experimental facility at my lab. And for the, as Dr. Witta has introduced, I'm working on the superactor and functional material. So I use the tube furnace, something scientific. I bought it from Korea two years ago and to make the bulk superconductor. And this is my own system. And after making the target, Dr. Ita has known that we can make the film by using PLD or PED or like a CVD chemical vapor deposition. But the system uh, belong to faculty of the physics. So we have to make reservation to do that. And after make the film, we can use the penetron accelerator. Here, I shown here, penetron. The energy is relatively high, up to 3.2 mega electron volt. And we have a variety of the iron source to irradiate the film. And for some characterization at the some well-known system like X-ray or the SAM, or even we have we had the TAM, but uh, unfortunately, it was broken three years ago, so we are waiting the new fund to buy the new one. And uh, from last year, we restart the new PPMS quantum design system to fill up to nine Tesla, and the temperature could go to 4.2 Kelvin. And we use the, the closed cycle liquid liquefier. So we don't need to worry about liquid helium as uh, Wita and me experienced in Korea. Now we can do experiment anytime. And so after this talk, I would like to get some collaboration with all of you, especially on the sample characterization. Yeah, for some, I'd like to say about like scientific findings from my group. The first one, I studied the uh, vortex dynamic in high temperature superconductor. Here, I show the, the, for the power related application of the superconductor, the main point is people trying to increase the, the critical temperature like the TC, JC, or HC. Yes, the phase diagram. The right one is the superacting critical surface. So, so, but small problem is for each superconducting system, the TC is somehow limited from one system. It's not easy to increase few tens of the Kelvin for the TC. So instead, we try to keep, to maintain the TC and we increased the critical current density, JC, and critical magnetic field, HC, for power application. And the two main material we are doing, my groups is doing now is BSCCO and MGB2. And for MGB2, I am expecting that I will have a further collaboration with Dr. Uita. And for in order to, as I said, we, we are aiming to improve the JC and HC. So the model for that, we need to have, uh, we need to look back for the, to the pinning center in superconductor. The left picture is the like intrinsic pinning landscape for all of the material. Since uh, we have a last kind of the, the intrinsic pinning, like a misoriented grains or grain battery, IB plane, some kind of edge dislocation or secondary porosity point defect. And some we can have like a twin boundary, anti-phase boundary or 
integral stacking for this kind of pinning landscape might occur in all kinds of the material. And different kinds of material will try to use this kind of pinning effectively. And from the, 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 the left picture is the intrinsic pinning landscape and the right one is the artificial pinning landscape. We think from intrinsic, so we try to make or to add artificial, artificial pinning center. And based on the geometry classification, we usually have like a 0D, uh, 0D, 1D, 2D or 3D pinning center totally depends on their geometric key, geometrical uh, distribution. And in order to dope or to make artificial pinning center, there are two parallel techniques. The left one is in, in situ. This one, like for example, we can do the simultaneous YBCO nanopore growth. We can use the, chemical, uh, the physical vapor depot fusion and the artificial pinning center the, at the nanoscale were automatically formed during the sample preparation process. And after writing the sample, and if we have a high resolution system like a high, high SAM or high or TAM, we can check the formation, the shape, and some like uh, the, crystal, the crystallinity of the artificial, artificial pinning center, they formed it nanoscale. And the later, the ST2 technique, we kind of, we do it separately. We can make, or we can grow the nanoparticle on the first, and then like in forms of the random nanoparticle on the clean surface, and then we covered by magnetic phase or super thin thick layer on top of a face. And, and then uh, during in this parallel way, we can investigate the vortex pinning mechanism, the nano strain between the nanostructure and the superconductors. Here I show some the region our, our region publication in 2021 yeah we met uh, we substitute sodium into bscco bs bs bsccco visco polycrystal we make the bulk sample means that it is a, this is the polycrystal and uh the left feature show the the face we have the clear enhancement of the JC between the pure visco and substitute visco at the all investigated temperature, as we might see from 25 Kelvin to 65 Kelvin, all JC enhancement were obtained. And in order to examine the physical meaning beside this research, we applied the collective pinning theory to describe the inferior JC with the function indicate in figure C. By fitting like that, we obtained like we can separate this one to the single vortex pinning, collective pinning, and thermal fluctuated pinning. And the, the dry top figure, I show how to determine precisely this parameter BSB, BTH. And also another property, uh, sorry. Beside the JC, another property might be used to indicate our improved pinning property is a ir irreversibility line. And all uh, the substitute sample show the improved BIRR and the fitting was inserted here. So we can find the rope gen flux script enhancement of irrevers irreversibility line. And for the um, pinning mechanism, is the geohicus used model is really famous in the superconductivity from 1974. Uh, after applied the model basing on the value of P and Q, we can find we can uh, determine the type of the pinning from 
like uh, if p is equal to 0.5, q is equal to 2, we have green boundary pinning or like normal core service pinning. And if this this pair is to be 1, 2, we have point light pinning or normal core pinning. And so in our sample, we substitute sodium into calcium site, we have the induced point light defect. And we got a shift from server service pinning to the normal point pinning. And the scaling behavior FPMS is proportional to BIRR exponent alpha. We found that the dominant pinning mechanism in our old sample from pure to, the, to substitute sample are all temperature independent. And similarly, uh, after got the first result on the induced point light defect, we add nanoparticle. The nanoparticle, sorry, I did not show the time images for this nanoparticle here. The average size is around 25 nanometer. And we drop to BSCCO, we found that the, the enhancement was obtained with the proper addition. If we add too much JC de degrees, and we have the TAF, T -A -F -F, thermal activation flux, flux flow to Ahenor's relation to fit. And we, we gave two possible regions for the, the improved flux pinning. First come from the enhanced pinning force density. And second region is attributed to the strengthened pinning potential as we could see from last figure here. It is uh, while TC gradually decreased, it's remained above 85 Kelvin, still strong enough for the liquid nitrogen point. Uh, the, po the potential pinning and pinning potential uh, was in get the maximum at uh, the doping level was uh, X is equal to 0 0.02, and I I show here to explain that. So the results so far, like uh, we success, successfully enhanced uh, JC or flash spinning property by uh, using 0D and 3D APC. So how about the 1D APC? We call the controllable defect. So for the 1D, APC, it is really helpful if we work on the film, not on the polycrystal or the bulk sample. It is the, here I show the formation of columnar defect. The left figure show how difference between columnar defect pinning and like a nanoparticle pinning. When the field penetrates into the type two superconductor in terms of the vertex, like that. And if we have a nanoparticle pinning, pinning by 3D, not whole sides of the vertex are pinned. Just pin point by point and the rest one relatively flexible. So when the current is applied, the induced Lorentz force still cause some movement, even the slight movement of the vertex which induce the resistance means the superconductivity degrade. So instead of the 3D, people have thought about 1D. We make the columnar defect from the bottom to the top of the film. By doing like, like that, we expect that the whole side of the vertex are strongly pinned. In order to make this kind of columnar defect, there are two ways. The first way is the bottom, uh, the bottom up, we, de we decorated the surface by using the nanoparticle surface de decoration. And then the supernatural layer was deposited on top of it. And the induced dislocation might be formed uh, due to the lattice mismatch between the supernatural material and the, the, the nanoparticle here. But in this case, it is not easy to control the height of the dislocation. We could not know how high this, this dislocation grows. They can go 
truly from the bottom to the top, but it might stop at whenever they want. They want mean like some like a physical explanation behind that. We could not find it right now. And we people have tried another way. We call the bot the top down. This means we can make the film, the pure film, the good quality, the high quality film, and then we can use the uh, ion to to be to be irradiated from the the top by con by controlling the the ion energy and the ion dose and even the ion angle different different kinds uh, different kinds of columnar defect might be formed here and this system is at our faculty so in the future if you want to do experiments just simply contact me and we can do the collaboration right away right away we have lots of iron source from uh, the metal, the ferromagnetic iron source, or even semi-metal iron source, we have all, don't worry. Even light ion, then heavy ions, don't worry. And we have irradiated oxygen ions on MGB2 film. Oh, Dr. Uita has well known about, about that. And when we kept the energy was 200 kilo electron volt, the clear enhancement was obtained. And so while applying the dual model, we also found the shift from surface pinning to number point uh, pinning. And from this, from the table, you can see that when we increase the ion energy, the penetration or the depth, how deep ion through was is estimated by using the nuclear program, the stream. And with increasing ions energy, we can have like a deeper, deeper path of the ion here. And at that time, we did not have enough time, so we stopped experiment at 200 kilo electron for the oxygen. And this paper was published in JAP 2019. And uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, something happened. Can I show by another way? What? I don't know what happened. Uh, so sorry. Can I turn it off and then uh, I don't know why. On the left hand, we can see the data, but uh, the right one, the image cannot currently display. I don't know what happened. Okay, I will turn it off and reopen it. So, so, so sorry for this situation. Mm. Now I, when I reopen it, all figure from beginning to now, oh, sorry. I'll try to open another file. Okay, I think this. Uh, new share, I want to have new share. Okay. 
could you see new our new slide? Yes, we can see clear. Hi, everybody. Could you see my new slide now? Yes, we, we okay. can see. We can see very much clear. Okay, thank you so much. I, I don't know what happened for this slide, the newest version, but probably some something happened. Okay, I'm able to show it. Okay, and uh, after finishing with the irradiation, the oxygen ions at uh, 200 kilo electron volt on MGB2, few months back after Hanoi lockdown due to the COVID, we have finished. We use the tin oxide SN. And since the film thickness was around 500 nanometer, so we try to apply two mega, two mega electron volt to so that most of the ion could go through the thickness, thickness of the film. Since we are aiming to make the columnar defect from top to the bottom of the film height. And checking X-ray, we could observe the shift, the continuous shift of the 0002 shift from the, towards the lower ang angle. And did the, did the zoom X-ray. And yeah, this figure first, we can compare the TC with the C axis constant. And Dr. Wiss had known about like a triple R and a rho T over rho 41 the, the Kelvin we can fit and the uh, empty GFC. This data measure at uh, the Kwan University uh, and uh, we can say both things. First, the TC is gradually decreased and in order to maintain high enough TC, so the dose up to 5, 10 to 13 was applied. If the dose 10 to, 10 to 14, TC decreased too much and up to less than 5 Kelvin, it's not good enough for like a power application of MG B2, so we stop at a 10 to minus 13. And we use four group contact to check, and we can find the clear enhancement of HC2, the, the upper critical field HC2. And by the fitting Gisberg Landau experimental fitting, we can estimate the HC. This, this one might be set at the BC2 at zero Tesla up to 13 Tesla. And it's, relative, it's relatively high HC2 when we compare it with other paper. And for the changing flux spinning property, this data all measure at our PPMS and at 5K and the 5K and the 20K. We have found the optimum ion dose for the JC enhancement, 5, 10 to minus uh, 13. And for 7, 10 to, uh, 10 to, not minus 10 to 13. And for 7, 10 to 13, we had a slight, uh, a, a clear JC decrease. So this is the option, uh, the, the optimum dose for the JC enhancement for both uh, one, two, three, four, five figure. And when we is estimate the pinning type, we also found the shift from normal, from normal surface pinning to the normal point pinning. The, the dominant normal point pinning might be explained by when we drop it, when we, ah, sorry, when we irradiate it, the film, the more point light in fact might be induced. So also we also did add the irradiation of the nickel ions on MGB2. Since it is a magnetic ion, it is a non-magnetic ion, we would like to compare the second effect on it. And the, we keep the, the ion depth and keep the film thickness. But we have found some interesting, interesting feature. Yeah, at a low dose, the peak shift of the X-ray was not strong. But we, when, we, when we increase to the 
10 to minus 13 to five two three five the clear shift to lower and compared to and i report this figure so we can um, see or oh, should be some effect when we use the nickel irradiation so i'm thinking to send to Mianaga, dr Uitano, uh, to check the exam so we expect to have some hint or so or, or some explanation about that and for the local structure analysis, yeah, this is X-ray absorption spectroscopy. It is two general slides to explain about the principle of the measurement. And we the X-ray is absorbed by the atom. The electron might be emitted and some like a bombardment with, with the neighbor item so we are going to have a uh, oscillation and by the the obtained spectra could be divided by in two parts the x-ray the sun s x-ray absorption near f structure and the exact extended x-ray absorption final structure and from sun s we can we, we may calculate like an ion oxidation state of sensitivity and from the exaf we may Say we may calculate like uh, bond length, bond the ang angle, the bivalent factor, and so on. And we have applied this to our BISCO. And when we substitute sodium into the sample, we found some increased, slight increase the TC. And to explain that, we calculate we measure copper K at sun S and we can calculate the valence states. When we valence state here, oh, and we com compare two behavior, we may say that the, there is a link between copper valence state with, and the TC, two behavior, they are too similar. So this one might be the origin for the TC variation in our uh, sodium substitute BISCO. And so by using the Fourier transformation, we can estimate like a bond length, copper oxide bond length, or this for the first and the strongest uh, peak here. And we estimate a copper oxide bond length and full half of, with maximum from the X-ray. We found the gradual decrease, exception for 0 0.03 sample both the figure so this sample need to be need to go to further study uh, excuse, excuse me just yeah. yes. uh, five minutes okay five minutes left All right okay. i remember five minutes left and then uh, we also apply and this year we have published the paper we also measure copper L to three H and sort of sun that when we dopped, when we dop ferro super paramagnetic material into BISCO. And we show that here we show copper L to three H and copper K H. We can delete and we use some fitting function. We use Gauss distribution fun function and we can, we may estimate the whole concentration, copper valence state, and even the whole concentration directly from here. So we compare, we, we, may, say, we may say more precisely about the origin, the, the decrease of TC in this system. And so this uh, paper, uh, this technique is really helpful if we want to, can, to study lo the local structure variation. And also we also applied this one on sun study on the perovskite material, the aluminum oxide nanoparticle added into LSMO. And we found also found some change in the MN valent, valent state. It is decreased. And the origin for the this degree might be expected to come from the substitution of this one of the IL aluminum ions into 
M and size and this degrees thin, the ionic radius is too similar. So, and de de decrease that. And so when the aluminum ions enter the le this lattice structure, they can form some ferromagnetic phase. And from MHK, also I don't have the, this data right now here. Uh, we have MHK, we can see some ferromagnetism behavior in the DOP material here. Oh, sorry, but the, it is the end of my presentation. So I'm so sorry that the slide to say thank you to all of you for in previous slide, but somehow it gets some problem. So I could not show this slide here. So sorry for that. And thank you for listening to my talk. So I expect some like a sharing information and like the future collaboration between uh, with all of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Tran. So yeah. uh, yes, it's okay not to display the thank you uh, slide. Yeah. We, can, well, we can hear you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and uh, is there any in the audience uh, has something to ask or um, share um, about this uh, topic of Professor Chan? Uh, please, anyone? It seems that Dr. Agu like okay please Hello? yeah yes uh, thank you for your interesting presentation professor Tran. Uh, yeah. i want to ask about the the uh, current density current okay density, yes sir uh, the, the data of your current the current density data of, of your presentation uh, okay how you measure the current density uh, uh, is there is there directly uh, measure the current density or you you calculating the based on um, the magnetization of the of the sample? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And for the critical current dens density, there are two way to me measure it. The first case we can use IV curve, right? We directly yeah, yeah. measure the critical current yeah. and the second way we can measure yeah. from hysteresis through and yeah. yeah hysteresis through at low temperature and then we can apply the beans model beans, yeah. beans model to calculate that and most of the data i showed here we use the hyster hist the magnetization loop to calculate uh, the okay. jc yeah okay yeah yeah uh, because uh, this interesting data about yeah. the uh, critical current density, I think. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, because my team also has the uh, research on superconductor. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice, sir. especially for MGB2. Okay, and, Ooh, wonderful. But, but uh, our sample uh, is especially for the wire, wire uh, MGB2. Wire? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I, and I'll. And my team also seek the 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 measurement of uh, critical current density. Maybe okay, please send to uh, me. Maybe we can have a collaboration about this. Okay, sure, sure, yeah. Uh, this whenever program. you want, whenever yeah. you want, please send email okay. to me and send sample to me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And or oh, if we can make the why really good, if we could apply the irradiation technique. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, so far, it's not many people talking about that. Usually, yeah. using high energy, up yeah. to three electron volts. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Agun. Uh, actually, this is quite your data is quite good. I mean, the the JC is uh, the flux depending on the MGB to flow. Yeah. This is uh, very nice, actually. Yeah. So, uh, yes, we are looking forward to have uh, more collaborations with your yeah. lab in your university. Yeah. So, um, after this, probably there will be emails uh, sending yeah. to you, uh, sent to you uh, by uh, our collaborators here. And yeah. um, yes, uh, is there any other? Uh,
uh, other sharing probably or from the audience uh, from the uh, uh, I mean as the last and, uh, and also I, I want to ask uh, Professor Tran maybe. oh okay sir <laughs> uh, <laughs> my sorry. pleasure uh, uh, I want to know about your your pinning uh, pinning effects pin, uh, pinning properties effect in on uh, STC uh, how about the properties the the properties that measured by ultrasonic mm -hmm. measurement did you consider did, did you consider this measure the this measuring ultrasonic measurement, measurement. Ultrasonic measurement. Uh, yeah sorry since so far i have not thought about it about uh, it yet uh, i i heard uh, i'm i'm graduated from uh, iwate university from japan uh, and yeah. my research especially the measurement of uh, ultrasonic ultrasonic oh. conductor okay and oh. this measurement system has the the powerful uh, information about the pinning effect ah okay so yeah i think it's a good maybe idea we can discuss ah. about this uh, okay sure. or, or this and this the reference paper to me i'm going to check yeah yeah the ultrasonic system we had at my our, at our university but yeah. i'm not so sure whether we can measure it at low temperature yeah yeah uh, this is sure the measurement that. on uh, in, yeah. in low temperature yeah of if yeah. it if it is going to be measured at room temperature it might be much easier and we can start yeah. okay please send the reference paper to me i will spend time to read okay. thank you yeah thank you so much sure. okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Agu, for uh, that uh, questions and sharing. And thank you also for uh, your presentation and your uh, interesting mm -hmm. talks, uh, Professor Chan. Uh, yeah, thank from, you so um, much. Yes, uh, and uh, hopefully we can continue our um, mm -hmm. collaborations in the future. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank yeah, you. Thank and you. Um, yeah. for the next yeah. speaker, uh, we will continue to the uh, third speaker. Um, before we begin um, talk, I would like to read some of his um, CV here. Okay. Um, his name is Professor A. Chan. Uh, he is currently as the English as he where is that? A distinguished professor from the Department of Physics, National Taiwan University, Taiwan, and also he is as um, okay Taiwan director of NTU IBM Quantum Computer Hub, also adjunct chair, chair professor uh, from the Department of Business Administration of a uh, Chong Chong uh, Christian University. And another role is the consultant of Hon, Hon Hai Research Institute. So, um, and what, okay, his, um, talk, his talk will begin, um, ah, okay, I'll, before that, I will read the research project. Um, he is active in Spintronics and their applications and um, and also has some personal projects uh, including a, a lot of interdisciplinary and interview projects for special task forces and also um, also he is he was in charge of the first nanoscience pioneer project from NSC and almost also the most Universe, MOST University Industry Project for more than for more 18 years, and um, currently he is in charge of the promotion of quantum computer application for MOST, and uh, his current research activity uh, is now involved in highly successful research group carrying out com computational and theoretical studies of magnetic materials within the Department of Physics 
National Taiwan University. And he also, oh, they have also collaborated with a lot of experimental groups around the world and um, also has a productive collaboration with experimental group all over the world. And uh, for today's talk, uh, he is, his topic talk will be, okay, he has already shown us, so disrupted and revolutionary era of quantum computer. So um, if you are ready, Professor, you can, you can uh, start your presentation. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Thanks for the invitation from organizer and also Professor Masno. And uh, yes, as uh, the, the, the organizer just mentioned, actually I recently uh, main duty actually is uh, some kind of the promotion of the application of quantum computer. And uh, I probably will spend the next 40 minutes to give you a general introduction of what is the current status of the quantum computer worldwide and uh, what we have done in Taiwan. And uh, this is uh, quite exciting and the new field. And uh, most uh, country actually just involved. However, it's very important. In particular, for the physics major, we have the benefit to join and uh, have the you know quite a lot of privilege to use this than other free curriculum. So actually, I will give you some basic concept. Uh, right now, we call it is the second second revolution, quantum revolution technology. And uh, it will use, you know, several new idea or concept from quantum mechanics. Mainly today, I will mention that actually superposition, entanglement, and also quantum mechanics. One thing important is the measurement. And uh, the quantum computer actually was constructed machine. We can manipulate and operate this everything inside the Hilbert space. In uh, compared with the classical computer, it's very different. Classical computer is a digital world, one of zero. However, quantum computer is some kind of operator and the opera operation idea inside the Hilbert space. So that's the reason why they will become so fast. A lot of people ask about what is the time for the quantum age. Frank to say, I think it's already coming. So, Right now, in, during the popular talk, I usually advise no time to ask when, just believe it, learn it, and use it now. So I will probably give some introduction on the what is the hardware algorithm and also the application now. And hopefully I can draw your attention for join this very exciting and interesting game from the quantum computer and the their application. Uh, actually, quantum mechanics is not easy. Just like Niels Bell mentioned, those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory cannot possibly have understood it. When, you know, the first time I learned the quantum mechanics, actually a quantum physics as a sophomore and undergraduate, it's very positive because actually a lot of concepts you never encounter in the daily life. So then later on, you accustom uh, through the mathematics and the gradually you believe that it actually is the things for the universe. Uh, Feynman also say similar things. If you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. And also Heisenberg also mentioned that only is the universe stranger than we think. It is stranger than we can think. However, nowadays, we really use the quantum machine to solve the problem. And uh, so right now in America, graduate, they teach from the primary school, the quantum concept. You, you are come through from the common sense in state of knowledge, then you will get to use that. The quantum science actually was occur or appear in Europe on the late 19th century and the early 20th century. This photo actually is a foremost 
final photo. The fifth Soviet conference in 1927. In this photo, and the, during this concept conference, all the fundamental theory of the quantum mechanics was nailed down. Inside this conference, Einstein raised a very famous question. Is God rolling the dice? And the ball actually re respond say, come on, Einstein, you cannot tell what God should to do. But anyway, after the quantum mechanics of quantum science was laid down all the foundation, the first application you can say that is Manhattan Project. 1943 to 46, with the relativity theory and the quantum mechanics together, U.S. make the little boy and the fat boy drop into the Japan and end the World War II. So this one can be the first application, even though it's not a good application. Mm -hmm. However, after that, United States actually got the the superpower. After World War II, even though the first classical computer was invented in UK, 48 bit, however, they use the transistor. Then US invention transistor and the MOSFET and with the CMOS technology, they still is the most advanced technology company inside the world. Nine, 2018, EU actually organized a conference in Vienna on the late, late November, early December. They called the Quantum Fracture Kickout Meeting. I attend that conference and they claim quantum science was invented in Europe. However, the best part actually it was all attributed to the US. Nowadays, it is the time for the second quantum revolution. And we, you at European need to work together to let the younger generation to stay, younger talent stay in Europe. And we are not only to have the quantum fracture kickout meeting, we will form a quantum fleet to let the spirit of the Europe to become prospect in the future. And the same year, actually US Congress passed the National Quantum Initiative Act and mentioned that United States public sector need to support the quantum technology. Also Japan, announced the National Quantum Lab Program. So people right now think 2018 is the, the kick up date for the second quantum revolution. 2020, late 2020, IBM put the 65 qubit quantum computer on cloud. And uh, we, National Taiwan University, as a quantum hub, belong to the network. So we can use the quantum computer on cloud. Now, people ask, did you have any quantum computer? Frank to say right now, e, just for IBM alone, they put the, about 28 quantum computer on the cloud. And the uh, usage actually is about 90, 70%. And uh, more than actually 300,000 registered users right now from worldwide. From 2016 to now, four, four years, already have 700 billion instructor was ex edu executed actually on cloud. Right now, every day we have 20, we have 2 billion actually execution actually on cloud. NTU, was one of the quantum hub, academic quantum hub, can use those things through the cloud. Actually, right now they have 16 quantum cloud. The most recent one I didn't put in here is the IIT from India. 
they have the major commercial partner pay a lot of money and the minor commercial partner pay a little money. Right now, actually, it's a complete network actually for the quantum computer application. And the most law actually mentioned about the technology actually grow as a two to the end spot. The Google chief scientist, Neven, Hartman Neven mentioned for the quantum computer is two to the two to the end spot. The first exponent two to the end from the hardware. The second the two to the end, two to the two end actually is from the Hilbert space because as long as you have the two to the n qubit, then you will spend a Hilbert space is two to two the n power. And that actually is the, the powerful things for the quantum computer. People pay attention on that. One of the main reasons is on the late 2019, Google announced one thing in the Nature article. They say right now is disruptive and the revolution things. They present the, an outcome was calculated by the 53 qubit quantum computer. And uh, for the 53 qubit, it's two to the 53 power. If you compare with the classical computer, they probably need 10 to the 16 qubit, uh, classical bit. It were equivalent to, to the two to the 15 three. However, Google actually use 200 second to calculate a random number pattern. And the like can, if you use the best supercomputer at that time, it's a summit in the Oak Ridge. Every second the layer can calculate about 10 to the 17 spot for. And uh, Google's 53 qubit quantum computer compared with the summit, Google, this quantum computer uses 200 second. You know, summit need one million year can produce the equivalent result. So Google say quantum supremacy is coming because quantum computer really can do something classical supercomputer cannot do it in the reasonable time. However, time is not the main issue. If you consider the physical size, if in the future we can have a 270 qubit quantum computer, it will equivalent to the 10 to the 18 classical bit. And the physical size of the 10 to the 80, 81 classical bit, if you take a square, which means the lateral dimension of this classical machine, it will equal to the 10 to the 27 classical bit pi together. If we use the technology still not existing, one narrow meter technology, then the one lateral side, will be 10 to the 18 meter. That will be much, much larger than Earth's diameter. And you cannot put on the Earth. So for the quantum computer, if you have 207 qubit, it's already much, much better than all the classical computer on Earth. Last year, the end of last year, China demo a strange things called Zhou Zhang, Lei Kren, they are even billions of times faster than the Google's result. And uh, this actually is a photonic setup. They calculate uh, similar things and uh, they can operate much, much faster, billion times faster than Google's result. So they can, they can do much better than the Google. So this one actually attract a lot of people attention. Quantum machine or quantum computer really is the future. This gentleman is the Mr. Ma, Alibaba's owner. He actually organized a meeting on 2018 and announced the roadmap for Alibaba. He said 2018, they demo 
actually 81 qubit simulator on the classical computer. And the Lacan on 2023, Alibaba will use quantum computer in all aspects in their company. However, let's say it's a very aggressive, you know, roadmap. I don't think it can success. However, it, it is the vision for the Mr. Ma. This is Trump. After 2018, American approved the National Content Initiative Act. 2019, he assigned the advisor meeting of the quantum computer promotion. This is his daughter and his science advisor. He claimed all the public sector need to invest on the quantum computer. Mr. Xi, last year, he organized a meeting and also announced the similar things. China need to support quantum technology from all aspects. This is a result published on the Nature on 2019. The quantum patent was approved in United States. If you can see China all together, the quantum pattern was much, much, you know, huge, a larger than any country in the world. However, if you divide by the three different categories, this actually is quantum communication. And this color bar is a quantum computer. And this color bar is a quantum sensor and the application. So China actually, was much advanced in quantum communication, but the United States is very advanced in the quantum computer and the computation. Quantum computer is just like a spear and the quantum communication is like a shield. Together with quantum sensor, they can form a quantum IoT in the future. Spear can attack the people. Shield can protect yourself. Right now, US and China is compete the part for things for the quantum technology. This is the quantum investment worldwide was summarized by the Canada. And as you can see, United States and the China are most advanced invested people around the world. China people from the external world estimate, he already invest 10 billion US dollar on the quantum technology. And uh, all those invest investment not include the defense budget. United States estimate China already in already invest 10 billion US dollar. China mentioned they only invest 1 billion US dollar. Actually, why so many, you know, powerful country want to invest on the quantum technology? Because actually, as I just mentioned, quantum computer is like a spear. They can attack people. So some people mentioned this is just like a Manhattan project before the World War II. If only one country get a leading technology, it will be dangerous. So no one afford to lose. This is a Manhattan-like project. Also, it's the best chance for the developing country and the new country to bypass one the developing country. So everybody interested to involve and uh, study this kind of the quantum technology contest. The current situation, as you can see here, we divide by quantum computer by three different categories. The first one we call the universal quantum computer. They can do whatever classical computer can do. So actually the big com international company are all involved, Microsoft, Google, IBM, Intel, Rigetti. Rigetti actually is the same company spin out from IBM. Also China, they call the orange quantum. The second one is just like the Jiu Zhang. It's a special purpose quantum machine. 
they only solve some kind of the special function of the quantum problem. Canada deal with NTT from the Japan. And the third thing is very interesting one. They use the current semiconductor technology and the, to simulate. So they call the quantum inspired machine to sit, use the hardware to simulate the quantum behavior. France, ATOX, and the Japan, Fujitsu, Hitachi doing very well. So usually we characterize the quantum machine or quantum computer by three categories. But however, they all try to serve the similar function for the quantum machine. This is roadmap for the IBM just announced this early year. Right now, they provide 65 qubit on the cloud. So we use that to do certain study right now. They claim the end of this year, they will provide 127 qubit. The interesting thing is that 2023, the crane is more than 1,000. And after 2024 and 2025, we're more than 1, mil 1 million qubit. If this is true, they can really follow the roadmap. The, the year of quantum computer probably will start on the 2024 to 2025. Right now, to use the quantum computer, you, you need experts because it's not easy, so friendly, not easy to use. However, IBM also claim 2023, they will implement the software. So it will become frictionless. Ordinary people can use that. And 2024, they will start to do the quantum correction. And then after 2025, they will combine the high performance computer and the quantum computer together to let old ordinary people can solve the problem as they wish. So 2025 is not too far away. So people need to ready the year of quantum computer. In 1900, New York Fifth Avenue, the most crowded street in the world, at that time, it's crowded on the street, but all full of the wagon. Actually, it's hot horse. It's full of on the street. Only one motor car by Ford on the side. Nobody believed the motor car can substitute the wagon. However, only 10 years later, the same spot, everything changed to motor car only one wagon on the sideway. So things change as they always do. And even the Google chief scientist say, it looked like nothing is happening, nothing is happening. Then oops, suddenly you are in a different world. Not what we are experiencing here. So be ready, the new things will come in. So the lesson, the rest time I will give a very short introduction of what is actually doing in the quantum computer. Actually, it's because of progress of the physics, math, and the computer science. And the important concept is supervision, entanglement, measurement, and Hebrew space. And what we can do that with quantum computer. Classical, com classical bit is only zero and one. So it's like the tail and the head of a coin. However, the quantum computer is a superposition because most of you probably are physicists. It's a superposition state of the one and zero. So if you want to think in a classical mimic, it's a, like a rotating coin. All the time, it's a superposition state of head and tail. However, the most strange thing is that when you have two coins, entangled together, no matter where the other coin is going or move, the other one is always know what others is doing and we call the entangle. So actually quantum computer, what he can do is the math and the physics we trust. We construct, use the qubit, a Hebrew space. 
We use the Hilbert space measurement is becoming important. I think everybody know about the uh, diffraction pattern of double sl 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 slit experiment. If you only have a one slit open, your projection of the on the screen of the light will be like this. If you another side, then your projection on this. If you have double split, it's a combination of these two or others turn out to be. You have double split diffraction. However, the bizarre things happen. If you put the electron doing the same things, it will be a superposition of these two projection or interference pattern turn out to be depends on where you measure. If you put your measurement next to the slit, want to know where the electron go, go through which slit, then turn out to be. The screen will show this kind of pattern. If you put your detector on the screen, then you will see the diffraction pattern. So actually the quantum measuring is most important things. So classical computer is that you have a high low voltage, 010101. You put your gate, gate operation, then you got output 101010. However, for the quantum computer is that with the qubit, you prepare the entangled state, not the 0101, it's an entangled state. Then you use the operator to do the things then it's like a measurement. You measure the output quantum state. You don't calculate the things inside the quantum computer. You just prepare the initial state. Then use the circuit to measure that. That circuit will fulfill your function. Then you get the output result. So it is like the, if you use math, classical computer is like you know, you're doing something matrix and the calculate things. However, quantum computer prepare the initial state, take the measurement, got the result. So you can consider that quantum computer just like a huge waterfall. You want to do your job, then you make your vessel. Different job have different vessel. When you finish your vessel, you put inside the waterfall, the result is directly came out. So the only thing is that how you make your vessel, that's your effort. The real quantum computer is just like classical computer. It's interdisciplinary job. It's not a physicist job. So right now in Taiwan, I always can. Only when Taiwan is realized, this is not a job for physicists. Then we can have the quantum industry inside Taiwan. However, the physics qubit, still need the phys physics involved. Right now, the leading role for the qubit is superconductor and uh, photonic and uh, ion trap. Even though we have a lot of different technology was going on, but it turned out to be, I think it's superconductor leading one, ion trap the second and the photonic the third. Other things is only minor. So for the quantum computer, because the qubit is inside, is qubit is very delicate because the coherent state need to pre protect it. So the thermal noise, thermal inference will affect the qubit state. So they need to keep your mini Kevin range. However, your operation result need to propagate back to the room temperature, let a human <clears throat> know the result. So how to operate the qubit inside the mini cavern range, then let a signal gradually go through the liquid healing range, liquid nitrogen range, and go back to the room temperature. It's an engineering issue. Right now, people expect the marketing for the very low temperature will take part about 20%. Start a company, enable technology over in this range. Start a company, 
fifty percent, where from mid Kevin to full Kevin. Then for the from full Kevin to the room temperature, it's right now the ordinary, you know, things can be extended to the low to the low temperature. However, for the below the full Kevin, you need a, we call the cryogenic technology. And right now, people over compete on this part. However, we also have the room temperature quantum computer now. We do acquire from the marketing two qubit. One is from the nitrogen vacuum diamond. The other actually is MMR and the only two qubit. So you cannot do the real things. But you can use that for the undergraduate teaching experiment. And uh, we get each one for our undergraduate student to learn. What do you learn actually is use the quantum gate operator. They need one is called the very common one is the called Hadama gate. That actually how you rotate the qubit and the poly X, poly Y, poly Z. That actually is operated on the single qubit. However, you also need some gate operator to entangle the things. So actually for the multiple qubit control gate, they have a lot of things. So the quantum circuit, what is your job actually to use this gate, compose your quantum gate to finish your job inside the quantum computer. IBM actually invented one bogan called Entangling. You can download from the IBM and uh, let a student to pray. Two students pray to each other. They need to get familiar with those gate operation. They can, they can finish it again and want the game. With the computer gate operator, you need software. So they have two. Right now, the old algorithm is still under developing. However, they have two very famous algorithms. One is called global algorithm to find the base rule. The other we call the show algorithm is get the factorization. Actually, they can attack the, the RSA code in the fi finance bank. I will not introduce much, but actually global search is just like this. If you have a mouse, they have cheesecake. You have the uh, detour every time when the mouse gathers one side. For the three branch, so they have eight exit. If we, I put the cheesecake on one of the exit, so when the cl classical mouse want to find the cake, what they can do, it's just like all the programmer did on the classical computer, on the searching problem, try and error. That's the only thing he can do. But a smart programmer, they will mark when they, so they will not get lost when they come back. So that's the only best way for the classical searching method, try and error. However, when the mouse eat the cheesecake, if they are coming uh, shredding the cake, he try to cut this mouse, what she will do? He will just like the diffraction go through the double spirit. Actually, superposition. So the shedding K will use the superposition. They will find where the mouse it is. So this actually is the algorithm and the quantum circuit for the quantum, we call the global searching algorithm. And this is a quantum circuit for that. So after you have a hardware quantum algorithm, quantum programmer, you can solve a lot of difficult problems, MP hard problem from the classical computer, such as machine learning, drug design, finance problem, and the RSA code. And also there are certain problems as Feynman say, this universe is made from the quantum. Some problems need to be solved from the quantum mechanics. So there also has some application. It's never be identified now because actually it's a quantum problem. Such as this one is the uh, 
Volkswagen collect with the leeway. They try to solve the traffic problem from Beijing city to Beijing airport. And if you have 10 to the six car within 10 to the 13 street, 10 to the three spa street, the combination. Excuse me, professor, I have time, five minutes left. Okay, the combination, you cannot solve it from the classic computer. You can need only can solve that from the quantum computer. So I will skip this, go to the education. United States now, they even invade the app. You can download the, they call hollow quantum to solve this kind of problem. And the United States mentioned now, quantum education is most important. You need to start from age three through the best side story. So actually they really invent a lot of the story for the mother to tell the baby from the bell side. As you can see, this is the founder of the Facebook. His new baby is reading the best side story, quantum physics for baby to teach them. And uh, they even in right now have a lot of what we call the national Q12 educational partnership. The goal actually is to bridge the gap between popular science and the advanced one undergraduate text. They actually put the quantum computing as a high school module right now on the web. And the list actually is some kind of the teaching class. They try that actually on the high school. So actually last two years, there are more than hundreds of startup companies appearing. Inside the nature, they say quantum gold rush. Actually the private funding pouring into the quantum startup. The quantum technology actually is a combination of the quantum and the classical industry. They will have new hardware, new software. They need new source, new talent, new industry, and a new direction. So quantum is the future. I think everybody in particular, the people have the physics background should join this curriculum now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Chan, uh, for your nice presentation. Um, again, is in the audience, does anyone have any uh, questions or opinions about this uh, today's talk? Uh, we talk. Yes, Professor. I don't have a question. I just want to comment to my yes, comments. Yeah, nice. my president, love them. Hi, Professor Chang. Hello, Professor Chang. Yeah. Uh, long, very long time not to see you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but your face is not, not so different than we last met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you. Hope can you know keep in touch. Okay, Th thank you for very much. First, first of all, for your uh, willingness to join this uh, webinar, and I think you gave the new uh, things to us. But uh, just my little little uh, curiosity. You mentioned that quantum mechanics is not easy. Yes, I agree perfectly about the uh, quantum mechanics is not easy. When I was a uh, fourth year sophomore, yes, yeah, you're right. I don't even understand what's the quantum mechanics. And the worst thing is my lecturer even don't understand, I think. So, so yes, this is right. And now you're talking about the computer, a uh, quantum computer. My curiosity is you are, you are good researchers and then you are involving in a magnetic material research. And what actually uh, makes you interesting in interested in these uh, quantum computers? You change your subject. I know you are not doing this when we met before, and I was uh, really surprised uh, for this uh, changing career, if I, I may say that. Can you explain that to encourage us? Maybe, uh, as you said, we are all physicists in this room. So thank you, Professor Chang. Yeah, uh, you know, 
you know, the life actually is full of surprise. Yes. You know, I never expect I will join the quantum computer, <laughs> Frank, to say about the, however, it's about four, four, four years ago, you know, when I visit IBM, mm -hmm. the IBM people told me, should we initiate some new collaboration program with NTU? Mm -hmm. I say, okay, what it is? They say quantum computer. Frank, to say a lot of time, I'm an outsider. But a lot of time I was vice president of the NTU. So I, I, I say, what do we can do? He say, how about sign a collaboration agreement? I say, of course. But a lot of time I didn't, I didn't expect I myself were involved. Mm -hmm. I think I will find a, a, a preferred person to join. Mm -hmm. However, let on, after I stepped down and the lease agreement signed, nobody want to take in charge on that. <laughs> As you say, to switch the curriculum is, is not easy. Also, four years ago, it's very unclear actually at that time. But anyway, I just stepped in. And the nowadays, actually, worldwide, everywhere, quantum computation and the quantum technology become so promising. So it's much easier right now. However, for a physicist, it's not so hard actually to join this. And uh, when you use the quantum computer, just like when I was PhD student, supercomputer came out. It's not easy to use. But right now the quantum computer probably it's much easier than the supercomputer computer to use compared with the 1918 when I was graduate student. Mm -hmm. So actually I will encourage everyone try to understand quantum technology now. I, I believe it's a, definitely it's a future. You know, if you allow me to have two more minutes, <laughs> it, uh, you know, the physics concept move into the technology. The first time actually is industrial revolution. Yes. A lot of time is the mechanics and the thermal dynamics. So let inspire the industrial revolution. People life change a lot. The second chance is semiconductor revolution. Mm -hmm. That actually is the physics concept, electricity and the magnetism and the photonic electromagnetic and the photonic ship into the industry. That actually is on the, probably is, uh, is 16, 16 e or 80, 80 years ago. That right now we call is the first quantum revolution. Even though they use the quantum concept, but uh, not as like as the second quantum revolution. Second quantum revolution right now, we need to use the quantum entanglement superposition. So actually, I believe the next 50 to 30 years definitely will be this one. So the first time the, the thermodynamic and the mechanics move into the industry, they need engineer. Mm. So the College of Engineer came out. The second time is the semiconductor. So they need a college of electro engineering. If you take a look at worldwide trend right now, definitely college of quantum engineering will appear for sure. I think that the, is the, and the, that actually is a duty to start from the physicist. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Zhang. Yeah, hope to see you soon. Sure, it's sure. In Indonesia, in Taiwan. Okay. I think you should visit me. Look, look behind me. My sure. background, Bali, Bali. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Professor Chang and Professor Yuting, for uh, uh, the uh, discussion. Uh, again, we would like to thank uh, to all of the speakers for today's uh, interesting uh, presentation and talks. Hopefully we can continue our um, 
collaboration or other uh, further discussion between two uh, between the university and our institute. Thank you so much for all the audiences, all the audience and uh, participants, and uh, have a nice day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you again. Okay, thank um, you. Bye. Thank you, Professor Chang. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.